This is CPSC 526-626, Lecture 8 on Internet Layering. So in the next part of the course, we're going to be talking about different network protocols and attacks and defenses that are security relevant for them. And to begin, we're going to just review the, the layers of the internet or the layers of the network stack and and then we can investigate attacks that are specific to each of these different layers. So recall that the internet design is partitioned into layer where each layer relies on services provided by the layer of below and each layer provides services to the layer above. And by analogy, when you think about software that you write, well, there's the code that you write in some programming language and this will in turn make use of perhaps a runtime library that you yourself didn't write, but provides additional functionality that makes your the job of programming some software easier. For instance, uh, a, if you're making a game and you might use a graphics engine so that you don't have to do all of the mathematics behind graphics in order for your game to work, you just focus on the game and the graphics engine handles the, the, the graphics itself. And that, in turn, will do system calls, things like opening and closing files, and these are then processed by the system itself, by the operating system, and say you are opening a file so you can save some data, this will eventually go to a device driver, which is responsible for actually communicating with a piece of hardware that will actually store the data, and at ultimately will be represented by voltage levels. Uh, for instance, magnetic tape storage will have a voltage high and a voltage low, and this will correspond to the binary 0 or 1. And so the point is that when you call fopen, you're not thinking about voltages. You're not worrying about how ultimately this data will be stored. Your concern when you call fopen is you want to store you want to save some data or you want to read some stored data but behind the scenes there is going to be a device driver that communicates with a piece of hardware that ultimately stores the data in some form and when you write a program you may not need to worry about what that form looks like you just want that you have the ability to open a file write some data close the file later open the file read that data back and that's this idea of these layers, these layers of abstraction, because the lower layer takes care of all of the details that the higher layer has no business knowing about or needs to worry about so that the higher layer can simply use the interface and the lower layer provides the services. And this design, which is frequent throughout all of computer science, is art of abstraction so that you can create easy to use, easy to develop pieces of software at a higher level without worrying about the details is also present in the design of the internet. So the internet layering, also known as the protocol stack, has the following important key layers. At the bottom is the physical layer corresponding to what voltage is represented in the file storing a file analogy. And at the top is the application layer, which is the actual data that's being sent. So the application might send open a socket, send a string of bytes, and the other side opens the socket and reads that string of bytes. But in order for that to get there, it, it, there's a transport layer. This is an example. TCP is a popular one. UDP is uh, its main alternative. And this is responsible for actually moving the data from the one machine on the internet to the other. So the transport layer will add additional capabilities and features. For instance, the internet is not reliable. Packets can be dropped. Packets can arrive out of order. And so when the application writes some data out to the, out to the internet, out on a socket, there's no real guarantee that it'll get there. But TCP provides exactly that guarantee because the application, if you're just writing a program, typically you don't want to worry about whether or not a packet gets dropped when you write your code. That's why you just use TCP. You don't worry about that detail. It's, it's worried for you uh, on behalf of the TCP implementation. Then there is the network layer, 
or and this as an example is IP, the internet protocol. And this again provides the ability for com computers on the internet to pass data between themselves. So computers specified by IP addresses and as your piece of data, as your packet goes through the internet, it's going to visit many computers, not just the two computers that are communicating with each other. In a sense, this isn't like the, the phone lines concept where two phones would be physically connected by a wire and a, a lot of switches, and that would ensure that, that there was a direct connection between two phones on the planet by having all of the connections of these wires lined up along the way so that two people could talk to each other. Instead, the idea of the internet is this packet switching idea where small information is discretized into these quanta, these packets that are relatively small, and they're just moving throughout the entire network, getting closer and closer to the destination. And the IP layer gives the instructions that allow the machines of the internet to route the traffic, to know where to propagate this piece of information onto so that it eventually finds where it, it eventually arrives where it's supposed to go. The link layer, as an example, Ethernet, this is the layer that's used to move this packet of information from one machine to another machine that is that it has a direct connection to. So on the internet, two machines can be far apart and they can communicate because they visit a lot of hops along the way. They visit a lot of computers before they reach their destination. Whereas at the link layer, this the concern here is to just move this one piece of information from one computer to another computer that it's directly connected to. Think that you have a wire connecting these two machines or you're using Wi-Fi and they're nearby to each other. When your phone connects to the router, it's a direct connection using Wi-Fi. But when your phone connects to google.com, it's going to visit many machines along the way, one of which will be the Wi-Fi router. And finally, there's the physical layer, which would be the physical manifestation of how this data actually propagates. So for Wi-Fi, it would be radio waves, or Ethernet, it would be the electrical signals through the copper, or whatever the material is made out of. The physical layer represents that moment or represents the phenomena that is this movement of data. Link layer, two machines talking directly to each other. Internet, two machines anywhere on the planet that are communicating via a sequence of hops using IP addresses so that the packets can be routed along the way. Transport layer provides additional functionality that allows packets to that takes care of details about the internet that such as packets being dropped, packets arriving out of order, or packets arriving more than one time. And finally, the application layer represents the semantics of the protocol being used. So HTTP is an application layer protocol that represents the notion of now that we have two machines that can talk to each other and exchange a stream of information, what does that stream contain? What is a well-formed message in that stream so that two sides, both ends of this connection, are able to effectively speak the same language, communicate in a coherent way to each other? This protocol stack is always drawn with the lower layers below and the higher layers above it, which makes intuitive sense, but when we actually draw a packet, the packet of information, we inverse this design. We start with the lower layer headers at the top, and then we put the higher layer headers afterwards. And the reason for this is that each of these layers is going to have typically a header that indicates all of the relevant information that it's worried about. For the IP, it's where is this packet going? And for the TCP, it's information about which ports and the sequence numbers so as to ensure that the delivery of the information is reliable. And because when, view, when this packet is viewed as simply a binary string, it's going to start with the leftmost part being the lowest layer header because that's the thing that that device that visits it is going to worry about. The 
piece of machinery that's going to be processing a packet w- typically will just want to look at the first bytes of that packet in order to figure out what it's supposed to do and shouldn't know any details about the link l- or higher level higher level protocols such as the application layer or the transport layer in making these decisions it should be the first bytes of the packet are the things that would concern so to represent this left to right binary string we draw it vertically so top to bottom drawing the link layer header first these would be the first bit that's actually transmitted in communication followed by the network layer followed by the transport layer followed by the application layer depending on the application the application data and then if there's any footers as well the footers would then come in the reverse order so transport layer typically doesn't have a footer or at least it doesn't for TCP or UDP, but were there to be one, it would be then the transport layer footer, the network layer footer, the link layer footer, if there were such things. And the footer is also called trailer. And so here we have an example of such a packet. The It is an ethernet packet, so there's an ethernet header and an ethernet trailer. And you can see that the message that is being sent corresponds to what the application layer receives. So when you call socket, when you call read on a socket, you get a stream of data. That data would be the application data. The operating system deals with taking away the transport layer, the network layer. So you never see this, you never need to worry about it. But what's actually arriving when you are using a network program is a, a bunch of packets. And each of these packets is suppose that we're using TCP, each of these packets would have a TCP header in front of it. And that would be the transport layer part. And also, and this is called the segment. So because we're dividing up all of the application data into these segments, and we're sending each segment over the internet. Now, each of these segments, in order to be delivered, has to be delivered using the IP protocol. This is at the network layer. So if we're sending a packet over the internet, we're using IP. This will then tell us, for instance, these IP addresses that tell the pieces of networking hardware, the routers, how and where to send and the, this piece of information, this packet. So at the network layer, we have what a router would see when it receives a packet. It might connect, it might receive a packet with an Ethernet header and an Ethernet trailer because that's how it's communicating with its peer is through the Ethernet. It removes the header and trailer. It's left with an IP header and then a bunch of other stuff which it ignores. It looks at the IP header, figures out who to send it to next, figures out how to send it to them, say it's another Ethernet connection, prepares the appropriate Ethernet header, Ethernet trailer, sends it to the next peer, who then again strips those, looks at the IP header, and this continues until eventually the machine does this looks at the IP header and realizes, that's me. I'm that IP. This packet is coming to me. And then it will remove the IP header and pass the TCP header and the data into the operating system. The operating system will then consider what the data is. The TCP header tells it where, which, where in the stream of data this segment now belongs, puts it into that stream. And if that stream means that there's new data available, then the application can actually call read and receive this data. So at the bottom, we have what the data would look like as it's actually traversing a, an ethernet link between two computers on the internet. And at the top, we have what one of the endpoints actually sees, either what it writes or what it reads. So the physical layer, this encodes bits to send over a single physical link. So this could be encoding of binary data into voltage levels. It could be encoding it into photon intensities if it's fiber optic. It could be encoding it into radio frequency modulations if it's something like Wi-Fi. This is just the layer that actually takes a zero and transmits a zero at a particular moment in time in some particular way. The link layer is the framing and transmission of the collection of bits. So while the physical layer can send a, a bit, 
the link layer is able to coalesce this into uh, some amount of bytes and trans and then arrange for the transmission or the receivement of all of these bytes. And for transmitting over the link layer, this may involve multiple physical links. So for Ethernet, you might be have a computer that's plugged in to a switch, and then it goes to the switch, and then from the switch back to another machine. And this will happen without the switch necessarily routing. If you're and routing that piece of information, it's just you control that network at that one time, and you broadcast it everywhere. Hopefully, the other end receives it. And so then in such a broadcast transmission, every node in the subnet receives this. So for instance, if you're using Wi-Fi, everyone within range will also hear your message. It's not that you have a, a communication to your router and the, uh, the Wi-Fi router and no other entity around can hear it. In fact, every entity that's connected to the router, or at least the ones close enough that, uh, that aren't twice as far from you to the router as it is to you, those will all also be capable of hearing the same broadcast. All right, so this is a, a broadcasted message, but all of the machines that receive it simply ignore it because they realize it's of no concern to them. It's not a piece of information that they are that uh, they should be processing, that they should that is meant for them to be receiving, so they simply ignore it. The network layer, then bridges multiple subnets, these groups of machines that are all connected to each other. And this is how we have end-to-end -end internet connectivity. This is how one computer in Calgary can communicate to another computer somewhere in the UK, traveling across the Atlantic, because it's going and visiting multiple computers along the way, that are bringing that piece of information closer and closer to where it ends up. The network layer also provides a system for global addressing. That is, every computer on the internet is able to be identified by its IP address. And so when you want to communicate to a particular IP address, that represents a specific machine. Now this can change with time, your IP address isn't something fixed, but at any particular moment in time, when your computer is actually communicating to another computer somewhere over the internet, it's going to be communicating to a target IP address that represents that specific computer that you're talking to. And the caveat there is that computers can be behind a firewall or a gateway machine, and we'll get into that later on, but in that case, there is a connection that the gateway then, once it arrives to that machine, is able to say, ah, well, when I was talking to this particular machine, it was heading to Bob's computer behind the network. So from your perspective, you don't know that you're actually talking to Bob versus talking to Alice in the same subnet. You just see a front, a facade machine that you're talking to, and that facade machine knows, oh, I should send this onwards to Bob or Alice as appropriate. The interesting thing with the network layer is it doesn't matter how the links actually work. The link layer worries about the links. This is this design with these layers. So when you're sending a packet, it doesn't matter that at one link it's going over Wi-Fi, and another link it's going over cable to the ISP, and another link it's going over fiber optic under the Atlantic. It doesn't matter that these technologies to do these links are changing each time. It has, it's inconsequential because the link layer is the part that worries about moving the packets, moving these bytes from one machine to another. And it does that effectively. So you don't need to specify the technologies or, and you don't need to worry about the technologies that will actually be used to do that transmission. You just send your packet and it may evolve, it may travel using different technologies along the way, but eventually it'll arrive at the end point where you're targeting it without any without you ever even knowing pre precisely how it actually got there and as these links occur different headers or perhaps trailers will be 
uh, added to the packet to facilitate its transfer. But these are all then removed as soon as it gets to the other end of the link. So if it's going to be an Ethernet link, it might add an Ethernet header. If it's going to be a Wi-Fi link, it will add another header. But these are never actually delivered to the end computer. They're simply only used to facilitate that one connection between these two machines. The next layer is the transport layer. And this is what provides end-to-end -end communication between processes. So that you can, for instance, open a socket, send a chunk of data, and, and not the other end, open a socket and read that chunk of data. The two main transport layers, the third one being a, a, a UDP-based one called QUIC, which is relatively new, but the, the, the two uh, main transport layer protocols are TCP, the Transmission Control Protocol. This provides a reliable byte stream. It gives guaranteed in-order delivery. It gives congestion control, which is an important measure to help make sure that the data actually flows at a, at a reasonable rate. The idea of congestion control is that it sort of determines whether or not there is it's sending data too quickly based on whether or not packets get dropped and intuitively throttles itself based on the, this perceived congestion. And the guaranteed in-order delivery, this works by numbering every single byte. They call, it's called octets in networking. It numbers every single octet of data. And whenever you receive data, it, you receive it along with which position it should be within the stream. And if ever you notice that you've received data, but there's a gap, you've missed some data, you can indicate that you haven't received this data. And this is done by acknowledging all of the data that you have received. So if you have not received bytes 8, 9, and 10, and but you have received 11 and 12, you'll acknowledge that you've only received up to byte 7 to your peer. And they'll send more data and you continue to say, I, I, I still only have received 7. So that indicates that 8, 9, and 10 might have been lost and need to be re-delivered. The other major protocol is UDP. This is known as the user datagram protocol. The idea here is that you're transmitting datagrams, a single message on its own, not a part of a stream, but rather just a one piece of information at one moment in time. So it may not matter that, for instance, it gets lost or doesn't, or arrives twice, or arrives out of order. You just want to send some information. It may not matter whether or not it gets there. Now, TCP has a slightly higher cost for its for its uh, transmission a latency because in order to establish a connection, it needs to already do a round trip communication, meaning that if you just wanted to send a signal in a sense, just indicate that something's happened, you have to have a round-trip communication to establish a TCP session, then send the byte and then close it. Whereas for UDP, you can just send it. And it may not be received, but if it if that's not a concern, then, uh, then you can do it that way. And for instance, if you are worried about latency, but you're willing to suffer some latency in some cases, then UDP works as well. You can just send it. If you don't get an answer quickly, you send it again. And you don't get an answer, you send it again. And so when we talk about DNS, which is the way we look up host names, the way that we turn google.com into an IP address, we will look at uh, the fact that it's implemented in UDP because of this reason that we want quick communication. And actually, this, this fact opens up the protocol of DNS to security attacks for uh, for interesting reasons that we'll also get into as well. The other main use of UDP, other than communication that you just want to be really quick, is for communication when, if something is dropped, you can work around it and it's not a big deal. And this would be something like streaming a video, for example, where if you missed some packets of information, it really doesn't matter because there's no sense in pausing the movie and waiting until you receive those bytes of data to arrive, 
and then continue playing it, it can just look fuzzy for a short second or something like that, and the movie can continue playing. You might notice some artifacts on the screen where it, it looks a bit strange for a moment, but then just continues on. And this may be that some of the packets were lost, but another example outside of streaming would be then voice calls or something like that, where you have some drop of the communication. It doesn't make sense to simply wait until that those pieces of information arrived, because time, in a sense, has been moving on. And you, we, as in, in a video conference, we can just say to someone, oh, I lost the connection, can you repeat that? In a sense, we're creating our own TCP protocol uh, at, at a much higher level to accommodate for the fact that some packs were dropped, so a snippet of a conversation was lost, but instead of worrying about that, it, the conversation just proceeds onwards. So those are the the two uh, common use cases for using UDP, but generally TCP is the correct way to uh, do traffic on the internet. There's Quick, which ha is trying to provide TCP-like properties over UDP, and there's interesting reasons to use Quick as well. But in general, if you ever find yourself writing a networking program and you, for some reason, think that TCP isn't what you want, there should be a really important, compelling reason that this is the case. Because almost certainly, TCP is the, the protocol that you want to use. And often what you might find yourself doing is saying, well, I don't want to use TCP because of some reasons. I'll just use UDP, but I'll add in congestion control, and I'll add in guaranteed in order delivery, and I'll add in all these things. And you end up just creating a worse version of TCP, because TCP has been designed and scrutinized and... and was designed by a large number of experts and has proven that it can reliably run the most of the traffic on the internet. And so simply trying to recreate its best features on your own is likely not, is going to result in a less optimal implementation. Nevertheless, there's always interesting reasons why UDP could be the better protocol. And so if the ability to ignore some pieces of information, if they don't arrive and just quickly move on, is appropriate, or uh, as close to um, low latency as possible is the important factor, then UDP is then uh, an interesting choice. And then at the top layer, we have the application layer. And this is communication of whatever you want. This is you write to a stream at one end, you read from the other. And this is freely structured. You can write whatever data you want. Now, it doesn't mean that other computers will speak this. You can't communicate over HTTP to a, serv a web server and just speak in a protocol of your own invention, but rather there's no real constraints to what those protocols can look like. So as long as you have a client and server that are both speaking the same protocol, you can then have them interact with each other. And so SMTP, the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, or HTTP, the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, or BitTorrent. These are all examples of application layer protocols that are built at the very top of this protocol stack. The application and transport are only implemented at the hosts, the endpoints of the communication, the Alice and Bob, not at the interior routers. Now, it's not that the interior routers can't look at this information. If they wanted to look at the application data or the transport data, they could. There's nothing preventing it. It's not like it's, uh, it's, it's not encrypted unless the application layer is done over TLS or something like that, in which case that would be encrypted. But TLS doesn't encrypt the TCP headers. Despite that, there's no business of these routers, these interior routers, to actually look at this information. So... In theory, they wouldn't. In theory, they wouldn't actually look at the transport layer or the application layer. They would just simply look at the IP layer and use that to route the traffic. Now, of course, ISPs do look at the transport layer. They do look at the application layer. In a process called packet shaping, they can figure out what kind of protocol you're speaking and throttle some and, and not others, for example. They can say, ah, well, we don't like people using BitTorrent, so if you're using BitTorrent, we'll will make it as slow as possible or something like that. There's nothing, there's, it, there's no technical reason they can't do that. They can look at the transport 
header. They can look at the application layer. Maybe it's encrypted, but they can look at its shape. They can see how long it is, how frequent the packets come. They can figure out, ah, this looks like this protocol and not that protocol because that protocol would look like this. It would have a different shape. This is known as traffic shaping. And they can do that and they can then make decisions based on traffic shaping. Say, we want to prioritize this traffic and deprioritize that traffic. But in principle, in a, in, a, in a world of net neutrality, they wouldn't do that. They would simply do their job, which is to route a packet as it arrives to the place that it's supposed to go, in, go to without doing this higher level form of censorship of certain kinds of protocols. The physical link and network layer, these are then implemented everywhere. So all of the hosts all, and the routers and all of the pieces of networking hardware along the way are going to understand these three layers. But the application and transport, these are only done at the hosts. So here I have a drawing of some machines connected to the internet just to give an idea of how data travels through. And to illustrate a very important notion that we're going to return to quite frequently in the, in the next batch of lectures, which is the notion of an on-path versus an off-path or not on path adversary. So here we have a corporate network taking up the majority of the slide on the left hand side. It has two Wi-Fi routers and I've drawn circles around them to indicate the hosts there that are in within range of each other. So D, E, and F can all are all within or D and E rather are all in the range of Wi-Fi router F and A and B are in the range of Wi-Fi router C. These are then both connected to a router I, and there's also a computer L connected to that. That connects to a router K, which perhaps is the gateway or the, the main computer, the firewall of the computer for this corporate network. There's also G and H, which are physical computers connected directly to, to J. And then it goes to the internet. This graph of nodes that are just communicating, passing data along, and then I've created three websites foo.com, bar.org, and oof.net. So let's consider the host D and the website foo.com. So D wants to just browse this foo.com. What actually happens? Well, there's a path that's created from D to foo.com. It goes to the Wi-Fi router F, which connects to the switch I, the gateway K, onto the internet, passes through a path. It may be multiple paths. It, the same data may travel the two different paths depending on how the routing works at the time. Or it may use one path for some data and another path for another, but let's just say it just travels deterministically through this one path and then arrives at M. So the question is, who can eavesdrop on this traffic? Let's say it's not encrypted. Who can actually see what, what D and M, what D is saying to M? And so I encourage you to pause and think about this. And so we have here, we have F, I, K, and the nodes on the internet. These would be the entities that the data actually passes through. So this is one notion of the ability to eavesdrop which is that they are on path. These are on path machines. That is, in order for D to talk to M, it goes through F, I, K in the internet, some subset of the internet. That's just how it works. That's how D is, in order to connect to the internet, D goes through F, I, and K. So all of these entities would be able to eavesdrop on the traffic, but also be able to modify the traffic, change bytes if they wanted, delete traffic, not route it. They're all on path. Of course, D and M are also able to see this traffic. This is by design, so we don't necessarily think of them as adversaries, but D could have some malware on his computer or something like that that might be recording this traffic. And as well, we don't know what's going on at foo.com. It could be the entirety 
M could just be a facade, but the actual machine could be much deeper. So we, we would consider foo.com entirely to be uh, possibly able to eavesdrop on this. And then finally, we have E. And the reason for E is that there, it's in the same radial range as D. So when D broadcasts, that's the nature of the link layer for Wi-Fi. When D makes his broadcast to F, E can observe this. E is able to witness this communication. And E, though, cannot necessarily modify it. So there's an interesting notion here of the passive versus active attacker. F, I, K can trivially be active attackers. They can modify the packets, no problem, because they're trusted to route the packets. E can eavesdrop because E is within radio range. E hears what D says and hears what F says, but its ability to modify it is not as clear. E could, depending on the way the link layer works, try to do some jamming of the signal, and maybe E listens to D's packet and then jams the router so the router can't hear it, but then rebroadcasts it later so D can't hear it. These attacks are definitely possible, but they're harder. And so we distinguish between on-path and off-path, but also between blind and not blind. So we would say that E is not blind, but also not on-path. F is on-path, and then all of the entities that are on-path are, are not blind, because they can see the traffic. But in this case, G, for example, we would say is a blind uh, adversary, a blind attacker, because G doesn't even see what D is saying. So if G wanted to try to a attack a communication between D and M, G would have a much harder time doing it. E could do it better because E can actually see when D starts talking, sees what D is about to say, and maybe modifies the packet at the right time, and F doesn't realize and F could do it trivially, because F is has the packet, and it's the one responsible to actually transmit it. So we have blind, uh, not blind on path, and not blind off path. And yeah, so I circled the entire radio range. Any entity in this radio range would be a would be possible to eavesdrop on this traffic, would be not blind to the communication, but they wouldn't necessarily be able to modify it as easily as an on-path would because they are not on-path. All right, let's do another example. G and L. So G and L are talking to each other. It gets routed to the corporate network. You can see it never actually goes out to the big scary internet. It stays entirely in the corporate network, so that removes a huge number of possible attackers or on-path uh, entities that would be able to look at the traffic. And it goes through the, the switch or router J, the switch or router K, the switch or router I, before going to L. And so J, K, and L, these are all on-path adversaries. They can see the traffic and as well, there's another caveat, which is that H, depending on how J is implemented, may also be able to act as an on-path adversary as well. And the reason for this is that if J simply reads G's traffic and routes it to K, so J acts as a router, it then H would be off-path. However, if J works such that every single message is just broadcasted to everyone listening, then H would, all, by virtue of that implementation, hear the communication that G says, because G just broadcasts it to all of the nodes connected to J. And that means that H could also pretend to be G. Now, G might find this strange and find it obvious, but nevertheless, H could act in this capacity by in, in injecting packets that G didn't say. Now, thankfully, G would likely notice in this setting, but nevertheless, depending on how J is implemented, H could be effectively, like, within radio range in our previous example, it would just be uh, um, not blind uh, adversary. All right. Final example. 
say we have the the Wi-Fi router C communicating to oof.net. So how might that happen? Well, it goes through the corporate network I and then K and then through the scary internet and onwards to oof.net. And so the entities that are on path I and K and then the routers on the internet as well. And here I just want to point out that A and B are not on path or not even with the, able to eavesdrop on this anymore. And the reason is that the C is the router, the Wi-Fi router. It wouldn't broadcast anything to A and B over radio waves. Maybe it's just going to oof.net to download a firmware upgrade or uh, upgrade or something like that. So it wouldn't actually indicate that information to A or B. It would just directly communicate to I. All right, here we have an IP packet. This is the, the IP header. And then you see in the payload, that payload at the bottom would be then the TCP or the TCP header or the UDP header, depending on which it is, followed by the actual application data. So this is the header for an IP packet. So the first four bits, so half a byte, indicates the version. So you may have heard of IPv6, that's version 6. That's the, the newer version that'll have enough IP addresses for everyone and their toasters. The IPv4, this was the standard internet, it has version 4 there. Then it has a 4-bit header length. So the next, or the rest of that byte, the other half of that byte, indicates the header length. And that is effectively the length of this entire header. So not the payload, but why do we need to indicate the length? Well, you see in orange, there's options if there's any, which means that sometimes these, this IP header will be longer and sometimes it'll be shorter. The idea here is that we don't need to transmit long IP headers all the time just to account for occasional use of long options. Instead, we just specify how long the packet, the, how long the header is. And with, with this information about how long it is, we can realize whether or not there's options or, or, or the options are not present. Now, you may be looking at this and thinking, four bits is not enough bits to represent the length of this header because four bits does not represent very large numbers and indeed it would just represent up to 16 and the first row of this of this header is already 32 bits which indeed you're correct so the four bit header is measured in effectively in rows, in, in words, or 32-bit words. So it would be, for instance, in this example, suppose there was no options, that 4-bit value would just be 5. And it would be 6 if there was uh, 32 bits worth of options or less. So if there are not enough, if there is more header length available, if we don't need all of a full 32-bit row, we just leave it as blank and we can just ignore it. But every time you want to add more information to an IP header, you have to add an, uh, 32 bits more. The next is an 8-bit uh, type of service, also known as a differentiated services code point, or DSCP. And the idea here is you could try to indicate what kind of packet this is to get preferential treatment. So you could say, oh, this is, I need low latency because this is voice over IP. Please route this quickly or, or, or otherwise, oh, it doesn't matter how long it takes to get there. Send it the cheap way, send it the slow way. And uh, there's an entire economics aspect of the internet that I know nothing about, but other than it does exist. So there is the costs associated with all of this routing of traffic. Then the next field is the length of the packet, a 16-bit field. And now this is actually measured in bytes. 
So it is not not in 32-bit words, as it was for the header length, but rather the total number of bytes in the packet. And this is because a packet will be only up to the length in bytes. It won't actually have or it won't have extra unused offset at the end or extra zeros at the end for acting as padding, but rather the payload of the data can be any number of bytes. You can take a TCP packet, add one more byte to it, and and so forth. So the total length is then a 16-bit value measured in bytes. That gives us a maximum size in the tens of thousands. But it's worth noting as well that for TCP implementation, there is a maximum, or when you're sending data over the internet, there is a maximum transmittable unit, and that is about 1,440, if I recall correctly, but in, in bytes, which is basically a K, so much, much less than the total amount available. But on the other hand, you could be sending a, a, a TCP IP packet over a local network, in which case you would actually be able to send larger packets if you wanted. Then the next field is an identification field, 16 bits as well. And the idea here is to support a process of fragmentation and reconstruction. That if you wanted to, for example, send a packet over a link that couldn't necessarily can send the entire packet together, you could break it up into a bunch of pieces these pieces would then be identified with this identification number that would say this this piece that you just received belongs to this family of, of IP packets and should be reconstructed together with it. And the fragment offset that follows it, 13 bits, is related to that. It tells it where in, it, where in the sequence should this piece that of data that you just received be placed. Then there's three bits worth of flags. The first bit it has to be zero. This is reserved. So it's just every IP packet that's ever been legitimately created on the planet has it as a zero in that position. The next bit is a don't fragment bit, which is set to either zero or one, where the packet, the IP packet can say, don't fragment me, don't use this identification and, and reconstruction uh, and fragment offset fields for anything meaningful. Uh, this packet should not be dismantled and reconstructed. And if this is set to true, then the packet will be dropped. It'll just no longer be transmitted. So, this could be useful to, for instance, figure out what is the maximum transmittable unit of data for a particular link, because it may be the case that when you test it out by sending larger and larger packets, they all get through, but it, they're getting through because of fragmentation, so you can set the don't fragment flag, and then you would know that, oh, okay, it's getting dropped, that's the MTU of this link. And the last bit is the more fragments. That just means that uh, there's there's more coming, or if it's set to false, that's it. You're, this is the last piece of information for this IP packet. You can finish reconstruction and, and send it on to the next link. The next 8-bit value, this is so crucial to the internet working. This is what stops us from having zombie packets that have been circling around the internet for generations it is a time to live, which just decreases every time it gets routed. So you can say when you send out your packet, give it a hundred as it's time to live. Say, send this packet to the other destination. If it takes more than a hundred hops, just give up. And every time a IP packet is received from one link, processed, and transmitted to the next link, that time to live decreases. So that time to live eventually hits zero. If you find yourself with a packet that has a time to live of zero and you're not the IP that it's meant for, you just drop it and say, looks like it wasn't meant to be transmitted by me at all. And so as a result, you can send packets out of the internet, but if they don't get routed in a reasonable number of hops, they just disappear. The next 
field is an 8-bit number corresponding to the particular protocol that's being used. And there's a bunch of well-known IP-based protocols that if you are interested in, you can look at the complete list of IP protocol numbers. But things like TCP is a protocol, UDP is a protocol, the Internet Control Messaging Protocol, which is what we use for pings, ICMP, that's a protocol, and there's a whole slew more of these protocols as well. And so this just indicates what kind of IP packet this is. Then there is a checksum, and you're going to get to know what this is when you do the next assignment, which is going to be on doing TCP injections. So you're going to have to compute the header checksum for the IP header and for the TCP headers. And this is just a simple error correcting checksum. It's not meant to be a security feature. It's easy to compute. There's no security uh, effectiveness of this. But the idea here is that sometimes when data is traveling, it, a bit can flip. And if a bit flips, it's it's bad. We've lost the data. We don't we don't know which bit actually flipped. A checksum allows us to detect whether or not a bit has been flipped because it's unlikely that a random bit error or two random bit errors or few, however many the checksum permits to be detected will result in a well-formed checksum. Now it is possible you flip some bits and you flip the checksum bits the packet will go through just fine. But statistically, if you just flip random bits, then the checksum will fail, and that allows the other link router to ignore this IP packet because something's wrong, some data's missing, it's not correct. So the header checksum is only on the header and not on the actual payload. And so... There is another checksum that we'll see in the TCP header that actually fulfills the goal of, of actually checking the data itself. Then the next two 32-bit words are the source IP address and the destination IP address. So this is now, if you looked at Traffic and Wireshark, and you see this IP is talking to that IP, this is where that information is coming from. And this is how traffic on the internet works. When Alice wants to send a message to Bob, Alice and Bob are both computers connected on the internet. They both have IP addresses. Bob has an IP address. Alice has an IP address. And when Alice sends Bob a message, Alice puts her IP address as the source and puts Bob as the destinations. All of the routers on the internet look at the destination IP address, see, ah, this is a packet heading to Bob. And if they care to, they could also look and say, and it's coming from Alice. But they shouldn't look at that because it's irrelevant. It's inconsequential to them. But they would look at the destination, say, ah, it's going to Bob, and then think, what's the best computer to send it to to make sure it gets to Bob? They send it to that computer, and each of these computers is routing the traffic closer and closer to Bob, making these decentralized decisions, just deciding who is the best place to send it to next, not actually having a holistic view, not creating a circuit, not imagining the path ahead of time, but rather just in an opportunistic or greedy strategy, what is the machine I can send it to that's the closest to where it probably needs to go? And this is how routing on the internet works. Finally, there's option fields, which can be used to add additional features to these IP packets, and then the actual payload itself which would then be a TCP packet, for example. So now the question, which of these fields can the attacker control? And when I say attacker, I mean these red boxes, these on-path adversaries. C is O, a packet. It goes through I, K, and the rest of the internet. Which of these fields can the attacker control? And the answer is uh, all of them with the sort of 
pseudo exception of the checksum, which, you know, if it doesn't correctly match, then will will be rejected by the next router. So an adversary probably can't control the checksum. They would have to pick the correct value. But otherwise, any on-path adversary is free to change any of these bits. There is no real control. Even the person who's sending the packet can lie about their IP address. They don't need to include their IP address when they send it out. Now, they do if they want to get a reply, because that's why there's a source IP address. It's like a return address on an envelope. You would send a packet out, you get a reply based on the source. But, as we'll see when we talk about some denial of service attacks, there's specific reasons you do want to lie about your IP address, your source IP address. If you are an attacker, of course. So an adversary is free to change any of these values that they want. So Alice sends out a packet, adversary can change it to go to somebody else. Or they can just increase the TTLs, the time to live for all of their packets and send it the wrong way and, and, and see what happens. As long as the checksum matches then the packet will just be accepted. So, an IP packet has two IP addresses, the source IP and the destination IP. The destination IP is a unique identifier, or called a locator, for the receiving host. The computers that actually talk to each other on the internet, they're called hosts. And the destination address allows each node or router to make forwarding decisions. So they can say, ah, this is the next place to send this packet so that it gets closer to where it should go. The source address is the unique identifier locator for the sending host. The recipient can decide whether or not to accept the packet. So the recipient can look at the source IP and say, hmm, I don't want to talk to Alice. So I won't even I won't even read that packet. I won't even load that packet. And of course, the end host, the destination host, can decide whether or not to send a reply back to the source. With the source IP, they can actually make that decision. The IP protocol or the or IP transport. This is based on a best effort of packet delivery. So the router looks at the destination. It figures out what the next hop is, this opportunistic greedy strategy. It doesn't promise anything. It just says, I'll try. I'll give it a try. You know, I've received this packet. I'll do my best. And this means that packets can be lost. Packets can be corrupted. They're, they're, they're being copied continuously. From They're being read, processed, copied in buffers, Road out again, sent over the internet, sent over Wi-Fi, sent over uh, metal links. They can have their bits flipped, and this is why we have these checksums. And packets as well can be delivered out of order. You might send one packet, and it goes one way on the internet, and the next one goes another way, and that other way is faster. Well, that second packet will then get there first. So the receiving host has to be able to reconstruct it. And for this reason, we have TCP. So now, let's talk about threats that arise from these lower layers. So at the physical and link layer, this is basically the wire that connects two machines. So the attacks that can occur here are eavesdropping. This is also known as sniffing, packet sniffers. And for any kind of a subnet... That is a, group, a bunch of machines that are able to directly talk to each other. Uh, that is, like, they can directly link layer each other a packet. So within a subnet that's using broadcast, such as Wi-Fi, such as your phone's Wi-Fi connection to its router, then this sniffing or eavesdropping is basically free. Any machine that's able to listen to a, or able to participate in a broadcast network would also by 
definition, be able to listen to everything in the broadcast network. And so any network interface card, or NIC, they can capture any communication on this subnet. Now, I think it's important as well to mention that this is not allowed to be done, so do not do this. It is possible to actually record the Wi-Fi traffic that's around you, but it is not legal, so you should not do that. The tools to do this is TCP dump. This is a tool that allows you to record all of the network traffic on your machine that your machine's actually processing. And this tool you actually should use. It's quite useful and quite handy to do. So basically, you can run it on your machine. It logs all the network traffic. And then you can do something like connect to google.com. And you can actually look at the outputted packet captures and see what they all are. And Wireshark is a wonderful graphical user interface tool that does protocol analysis. And we've already seen examples of this in previous lectures, where you actually see the packets and it. it's interpreting them, it's adding the semantics that say, ah, this is the protocol version, and this is the packet length, as opposed to them just being bytes in sequence. Now, Wireshark can also interface with TCP dump to do the wire capture, the, the packet dumps for you. Um, and the mode that you must not use is called promiscuous mode. So it's hard to accidentally do this, so don't worry about, about that. You basically have to disconnect from the internet and change your network configuration. But that's what's required to actually set up your system to monitor all traffic. Whereas if you don't do that, it's only monitoring traffic that's actually meant for your machine, that was sent to your machine. And there, the legal situation is clear that you can actually look at that traffic because it's traffic that you actually are part of, part of creating. When put into promiscuous mode, this corresponds to spying on other people, so that's why it's not allowed. Any router that's on the path can look at, can collect, can save all this traffic, is dump it out to a file, so they can all be eavesdroppers. And anyone that's on the path as well can say tap a link that is if you have physical access to the wire you can put some piece of hardware that will then tell you what the electrical signals are so a router can be on path at the link layer whereas anyone can be can be on path at the physical layer that is if you actually go to the place where the radio waves are happening you can listen that that would be tapping the link in that sense so a story on that, on that side of things. There was a uh, divers had discovered, uh, found a cable and installed a twenty foot long listening device on it. It was designed so that if the Soviets had raised this communication cable that was buried under an ocean, the this listening bug would fall to the bottom of the ocean, so it would not be detected. And then every month, divers for the Navy would retrieve the recordings of all of the data that pass through this physical link and install a new set of tapes to record. Upon returning to the United States, intelligence agents from the NSA analyzed the recordings, tried to decipher any encrypted information, and were surprised that actually much of it was traveling through without using encryption. So it was, I guess, believed that the, the, no one would be tapping these particular cables that uh, had been tapped during the Cold War. Another situation, here we have a fiber optic wire, fiber optic cable. This is just transmitting data through photon intensities, light traveling through a medium, in this case, a, a glass tube. And it turns out that if you bend fiber optic, some of the light escapes. So if you bend it enough, you will have emissions of photons indicating what data is going through that are separate from the data that arrives. So the end point, it's not that they lose the data. Both Alice and Bob still communicate, but Eve is able to actually observe the light as it's being transmitted along the way. So these link layer attacks are quite real. You can actually tap lines in a variety of different ways. So what about threats at the, the physical link layer? And well, they also exist at the higher layer. You can spoof 
somebody else. So you can pretend to be Alice if you can, for instance, inject some new packets in. And this is the spoofing is also known as masquerading or imposturing. And effectively, anyone with access to the subnetwork, like someone in the same Wi-Fi radio range or someone connected to the same switch, if it's a broadcast-based switch, they can insert messages and specify whatever IP address they want. So Eve can just throw packets into a subnetwork and claim they came from Alice. Now, if Alice hears this, Alice might get confused and maybe think there's an attack, or maybe Alice just thinks an error is happening and, and, and effectively thinks nothing of it. Or maybe, in the case of Wi-Fi, Alice just gets really close to the router and effectively whispers in, in, in comparison to what would Alice would be doing, which would be a broadcast. That is, Alice is not able to hear the message that Eve tells the router by Eve just going really close and sending it with a, a mild intensity. Now, on a typical computer to do these, uh, this TCP collection, and particularly to do spoofing, which is effectively creating your own packets, not using the implementation of TCP IP that the, your operating system has. That is, you open a socket and you write some data and you don't actually ever think about IP addresses or port numbers or protocols. But it is possible to actually create a string of bytes and give it to the operating system and say, here, send this out on the internet. And the operating system will do that. I mean, the operating system is already doing that all the time with the packets it's creating. Now, the operating system creates well-formed packets, but it is willing to send arbitrary packets as well. Now, in order to do that, you will have to be root. These are known as raw sockets. So you can open a raw socket and send a packet of your own design. And we're going to be doing this in the next assignment when we do TCP injection attacks. These attacks, these spoofing attacks, are particularly powerful when they're combined with eavesdropping. Because with eavesdropping, you can understand the victim's state of communication and craft accordingly. So, for example, if you were to inject a TCP packet, well, we know that TCP has this idea of sequence numbers and every bit octet, every byte of information is numbered. So if you don't know what those numbers are, you are not going to be able to insert your fake message in the right position in the stream. And there's also ports. And destination ports for TCP are usually well known. Like if you're talking HTTP, you're on port 80. If you're talking TLS, you're on port 443. But the source port is random. The operating system just picks a random unused port and that's what gets used. So if you don't know what the correct port is, you're also not going to be able to uh, communicate, inject a packet that will be accepted. So this is why being able to do these attacks while not blind is quite useful. Because if you combine eavesdropping with the ability to inject packets, you can actually create well-formed packets that will be accepted. Otherwise, there might be some guesswork. And we're going to see exactly what that looks like as we talk about the different layers and the different attacks that occur. Spoofing without eavesdropping is called blind spoofing. So this is you can't see the traffic, but you're, you're just trying to spoof anyways. So you hope that you're right. If you're on path, it means the traffic goes through your machine. If you're off path, it doesn't go through your machine. So if you're off path, this would be like Eve and Alice in the same Wi-Fi radio range, and Eve tries to go to the router, and maybe Eve is able to impersonate Alice and sends her message first, and the router gets out Eve's message first and accepts it instead of Alice's. So in this case, Eve is not blind, Eve can eavesdrop in the setting, but Eve is not on path. So the work of doing the spoofing is a little bit harder.